in the previous uh, lecture we have been looking at uh, the importance of sonochemistry in material synthesis and uh, we titled this uh, la previous lecture as unusual form of energy in synthesis. So, I will just uh, try to quickly recap where we stopped in the le previous lecture and then continue from then on. Um, we have shown this uh, flow chart where uh, the power of sonochemistry can be manifested um, where if you start with the, a carbonyl or a nitrosyl me metal salt. So, M can be anything and if you have metal uh, attached to carbonyl moiety or nitrosyl moiety, it is much easier to cleave the organic part by ultrasound and thereby you can stabilize uh, nanoparticles of any metal and these nanoparticles are very very reactive and sensitive to uh, atmosphere. Therefore, you can stabilize it you as a colloidal form, you can uh, use sulfur source to convert it into sulphide, you can use hydrocarbon to stabilize the uh, nano uh, phase of this uh, alloys or metals, you can uh, use oxygen to convert it into respective oxides and also you can trap this in inorganic support like alumina, titania and so on um, to create a set of uh, metal catalysts. In all these cases, the corresponding end products are extremely reactive because of the uh, nano sized metal particles that we can get out of this. One of the main reason uh, that sonochemistry is still being used is because the starting materials are very attractive. So, when you actually have metal is attached to carbonyl groups, all that the uh, sonochemistry can do is just break this bonds. So, when you break the bonds finally, you end up with uh, the metal nanoparticle and this carbon monoxide groups or carbonyl groups usually go out as carbon dioxide or as carbon monoxide in the presence of a carrier gas. So, the end product is actually free from any further chemical contamination therefore, you can really rely on using the uh, metal particles as such without any sort of washing or other serious protocols. So, this is one of the main reason why we resort to sonochemistry for getting real ultra powders and another uh, way that we can ascertain that these powders are really nano is when you expose it to air they decompose immediately into corresponding oxide indicating that they are very reactive powders. Now, um, in the previous lecture we looked at one of the um, examples of uh, the cobalt platinum alloy and how this alloy uh, affects both the amorphous property as well as crystalline property. Today's uh, 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 lecture I would like to uh, concentrate little bit on iron platinum alloys. As I have titled it here, uh, the amorphous alloys of iron platinum when they are prepared sonochemically they actually turn magnetic. Uh, what is unusual here uh, in the iron platinum phase diagram which we will see shortly, there are regions where when platinum is doped across the series, there are uh, some limiting compositions where the alloy turns non-magnetic. So, when there is a magnetic non-magnetic phase usually the properties would vary, but what we see in amorphous alloys of iron platinum irrespective of the composition of platinum everything is turning uh, magnetic and this is one of the view graph which shows that amorphous uh, alloys are uh, turning magnetic and the T c seems to be somewhere around 240 Kelvin. Um, how does the iron platinum alloy look? You can see from this uh, T m view graph that almost all the particles are mono size uh, and of the order of 1 to 3 nanometers. This is very difficult because um, usually when we generate such nano phase alloys you end up with uh, agglomeration and as a result to stabilize these sort of alloys usually we resort to some stabilizing agents or surfactants, but what we see here is that 
uh, even without surfactants you can clearly isolate such alloys and one fascinating feature is throughout the TM samples we keep observing this sort of self assembled pattern of iron platinum alloys and uh, uh, they are held together in some sort of a form, but nevertheless um, they seem to have almost a mono size when prepared. Uh, now, if you look at the uh, x-ray diffraction pattern uh, you can see here they show not absolutely amorphous, but with the more and more of platinum there seems to be some crystallization process that is happening, but without platinum you can see that this is a typical uh, amorphous uh, phase as seen from the x-ray diffraction pattern and uh, you can see this prominent peaks are emerging out due to platinum as you increase the ratio to uh, 40 percent of platinum. Now, if you look at this equilibrium phase diagram uh, which was proposed by Masalki and co-workers and this is available in the binary alloyed phase diagrams uh, published by ASM international. Now, if you see here there is a region up to 15 percent or so you can see that in this region the alloy is actually non magnetic and there is a region here where alloy is non magnetic and there is also a region here where alloy is non magnetic and there is another region where alloy turns non magnetic. So, there is a transformation from ferromagnetic to non magnetic ferromagnetic to non magnetic. So, uh, if one can prepare across the series the alloys we can look at the magnetic property and see whether it is really resembling that of the equilibrium phase diagram. So, in the next slide we can see here this is what happens when you heat this iron platinum nano alloy as you would see in the previous slide that it is amorphous, but once you heat it to 900 degree C you can clearly see the FCC pattern stabilizing. So, this is a FCC iron platinum alloy that is formed as you know when you heat it to high temperature iron is actually transforming to alpha ion phase uh, or uh, alpha ion which is uh, uh, which resembles a BCC phase, but even at high temperature we are able to stabilize FCC iron and uh, this is because of the not only the effect of platinum, but also it is the effect of sonochemistry because even for undoped one we are able to stabilize a FCC pattern. So, the uh, formation of metastable phase uh, is one of the real trump cards of sonochemistry mainly because um, you are able to get the as prepared powder which is amorphous in nature. Now, if you carefully look at the uh, VS, uh, VSM data or the magnetism m versus t plot m versus t plot here we have in the y axis we have plot plotted the magnetization and in the x axis we have a temperature sweep. So, if you actually do this both in z f c as well as uh, f c this is the 0 field cooled uh, curve and this is the field cool curve and as you see here. Uh, the blocking temperature is somewhere here, which means there are a lot of anti ferromagnetic interactions. So, if you do not cool your sample in magnetic field, then you see this sort of anti ferromagnetic interactions manoeuvring the ferromagnetic ordering, but if you cool the sample in the field which is called field cooled, then you can see here that it is turning ferromagnetic and this is not there only for x is equal to 10 you also see the same trend for x is equal to 20, 30 and 40. So, irrespective of any composition you see iron platinum amorphous alloys are magnetic across the doping concentration. If you quickly remember the equilibrium phase diagram that we saw these two regions are supposed to be magnetic according to the phase diagram, whereas these two are not supposed to be magnetic, okay. but irrespective of that in amorphous phase all the compositions are turning magnetic, whereas if you look at the crystalline phase which is 
the 900 degree sintered samples when you do the m versus t curve you can clearly see that the x is equal to 10 and x is equal to 40 they are immediately turning non magnetic. So, this is according to the equilibrium phase diagram whereas, in this case we see it is against the prediction of the equilibrium phase diagram. So, what we can say that although in bulk the compositions are known to show order disorder transformations leading to uh, magnetic and non magnetic phases in amorphous form the interactions are totally different as a result you get magnetic phases throughout the entire doping concentration of platinum. This is one of the fascination of studying nanoparticles because in uh, when the uh, <coughs> band uh, gap is altered when we try to play with the finite size effects then you can clearly manipulate or bring a drastic change in the magnetic property. And uh, the same is true uh, if you try to do rho versus T plot that is the conductivity plot in case of amorphous alloys in case of amorphous alloys you, as you can see all the compounds are showing same metallicity and it is very clear they, they show uh, a periodic metallic transformation whereas, the crystalline phases those which are magnetic namely x is equal to 10 and 40 which is magnetic in amorphous form they are non magnetic in crystalline forms therefore, they show a different uh, resistivity pattern compared to x is equal to 20 and 30 which is magnetic according to the phase diagram. And as you would see here in this rho versus t plot it is linearly decreasing whereas, in the case of the true magnetic phases you can see there is a small change in the slope especially in the place where there is a T c as you would see here I just want to point out because the T c is somewhere here as a result you would see a small inflection here going hand in hand. So, the magnetic phases show a different rho versus T behavior compared to the amorphous pattern. So, these are the surprises that we can see and also if you correspondingly take these compounds amorphous and crystalline compounds and if you can make a solid you sinter it below the crystallization temperature as I showed for cobalt platinum you have to do the DSC curve and below that uh, cr uh, crystallization temperature if you can sinter the compact and if you can do magneto resistance studies magneto resistance studies this is for the amorphous pattern uh, or for the amorphous sample you can see in amorphous sample almost all the samples show this sort of a MR behavior meaning the resistance is maximum, but as you sweep the field the resistance drops down. So, even though the magneto resistance ratio is feeble not of a very high order, but you can see in all cases it is turning th uh, that way whereas, in the crystalline phases in the crystalline compounds you can clearly see the non magnetic phases do not show any magneto resistance whereas, the 20 and 30 percent which shows a magnetic transition they respond nicely and they show magneto resistance behavior. So, this is going hand in hand only compositions that are ferromagnetic show considerable magneto resistance at T c. So, this is a um, confirmation that there is definitely influence of uh, the size effect uh, when we study the magnetism and electronic property and you see a systematic change when you go from amorphous alloys to crystalline alloys. Therefore, as we title um, in the uh, earlier slide uh, truly uh, iron platinum nano alloys have the potential to turn magnetic against the equilibrium phase diagram predictions mainly because of the influence of sonochemistry. So, therefore, we can even go one step further to sort of propose a new phase diagram for amorphous alloys. So, in crystalline alloy this is a paramagnetic 
uh, metal this is in this uh, phase it is a ferromagnetic metal in this phase it is a paramagnetic metal but in our study we can show that the entire region so from 10 to 40 is actually turning ferromagnetic metal this is the beauty of uh, uh, studying the amorphous phase and uh, we can even go one step further to say th this is the first observation of ferromagnetism in alloy compositions which are turning magnetic which is predicted to be non-magnetic ferromagnetism is actually stabilized by short range ordering and weak exchange coupling and the proposed phase diagram for the amorphous iron platinum na nano alloy is entirely different from the crystalline iron platinum phase. Now to give you another variation uh, and to stress the beauty of uh, sonar chemical approach I am going to show you one example of how complex metal chalcogenase can be formed for example if you take FeCr2 S4 this is a chalcogenate uh, this is uh, crystallizing in a spinal phase and uh, this is a, a typical representation of spinal where in a cube there are 8 octants and each one has a specific uh, metal to oxygen ratio and distribution and iron occupies all the tetrahedral holes as Fe2 plus <coughs> and the chromium occupies all the octahedral holes as chromium 3 plus and uh, the close packing is actually done by sulfur atoms therefore in a cubic close packed sulfur um, close packing uh, of this chalcogenides you actually have the chromium occupying the octahedral void and iron occupying the Fe2 plus void and as you would see here this is one of a very complex oxides where selectively each of these ions have to go and occupy therefore preparation is a major challenge most of these spinals are prepared above 1200 degree C centigrade now we can try to see if sonar chemistry can be used to prepare this oxide now what is the reason why this became prominent this particular composition was reported by Ramirez and co-workers in US in the year 1997 where they predicted that this particular group of compounds are showing unusual magnetism and unusual electronic property leading to a very large change in magneto resistance values as you would see here iron chromium sulphide can be formed and uh, they show uh, a typical ferromagnetic loop somewhere around 180 Kelvin and uh, uh, <coughs> you can see here that uh, this is the magneto resistance plot for a typical iron chromium sulphide but if you are going to dope uh, 0.5 of copper uh, instead of iron then you are talking about iron copper chromium uh, spin uh, uh, copper chromium spinal so in a solid solution containing equiatomic ratio of iron and chromium in this spinal you can see from 180 Kelvin the TC is actually pushed above room temperature so in that case it becomes a very good candidate for magneto resistance effect now typically you can see there is a colossal change in the resistance in this particular composition therefore this was reported to be a very good um, CMR uh, colossal magneto resistive uh, compound and uh, also because it shows TC above room temperature this can be thought or explored for commercial applications. Now having this as a motivation if you try to attempt preparing this iron copper chromium spinal uh, sulphide uh, spinal uh, using sonar chemistry this is the protocol that one would follow you can take chromium hexacarbonyl in decane iron pentacarbonyl in decane and uh, copper acetate because copper does not have a copper carbonyl compound therefore you, you take this and you try to dissolve it in um, deoxygenated uh, solution of wa uh, water where you try to bubble this with uh, argon or nitrogen and saturate the uh, water and then you dissolve copper acetate then you can take uh, ethylene diamine uh, with the sulfur powder and if we can sonicate it for 6 hours in argon flow we can expect some sort of a black residue 
and incidentally that happens to be that of iron copper chromium sulphide. So, this is the uh, this is the protocol that we follow we do not just mix everything together first we take copper uh, chromium carbonyl sonicate for 3 hours then you get a black solution uh, which will be like this and then this chromium is now added to iron uh, pentacarbonyl then you get um, the iron copper chromium sulphide and then because this is amorphous you try to heat this at 900 degree C and one would see a very clear evolution of this uh, chalcogenate coming from a simple protocol of um, sonar chemistry. So, you can see you can play around with a variety of compositions of iron copper in this uh, spinal and uh, what we have found here is for a optimum concentration of 0 0.6, 0 0.4 you can get the T C to be around 200 and then that also shows a typical metal to insulator uh, transition. Uh, going with the T C therefore, one can easily prepare such oxides, but what is fascinating is if you try to take the 30 70 composition of iron copper then you see the transition to be uh, to come somewhere above room temperature. Uh, actually if you do the uh, rho versus resistance versus temperature plot you would see a typical graph like this but if you try to blow up this area you can clearly see that there is a metal insulated to metal transition that is happening which is going with the uh, magnetic property. So, in such case if you take the um, <coughs> this particular composition and try to uh, measure the resistance both at 0 tesla and at 8 tesla you can see that there is a huge drop in resistance of this order which means there is more than above 70 percent of magneto resistance is observed above room temperature for this particular composition this is reported for the first time in the literature. So, uh, this is not actually going with the um, report of uh, Ramirez in uh, nature because there they have worked on a 50 50 composition, but definitely what we find here is that the <coughs> there could be a inherent uh, sulfur <coughs> uh, non stoichiometry which can actually induce this sort of uh, huge change in the resistance. Not only that you see here that uh, when you apply magnetic field then the resistance is higher compared to the resistance at 0 uh, tesla which means the magneto resistance here is not negative, but it is positive. So, um, what is reported is a negative magneto resistance, but what we see here is a positive magneto resistance at room temperature. Therefore, these, uh, this is also uh, typical of the method that we adopted to prepare these sulphurs. So, this is reported for the first time it has appeared in journal of applied physics in the year 1990 uh, uh, in year 2008. So, I will also take you to another example where we are actually trying to study the electronic conductivity of oxide polymer nanocomposite. So, what is beauty here polypyrrole is a conducting medium and if you can coat this polypyrrole which is a good conductor and intrinsically if you can coat this nickel ferrite nanoparticles then you can actually affect the conductivity of this nickel ferrite because nickel ferrite is ferromagnetic it is actually used as a spin injection layer in the magneto resistive device nowadays and nickel ferrite um, is a insulator. So, if you want to see some sort of a magneto resistance effect then one can try to uh, intrinsically coat this with polypyrrole. So, how can you do that there is a protocol by which one can apply uh, if you take pyrrole and APS and you sonicate it is possible to prepare polypyrrole. Therefore, you take polypyrrole uh, you try to uh, polymerize uh, pyrrole uh, in situ as and when you are trying to generate nickel ferrite. So, you are generating two things you are taking the uh, salts of nickel and you are trying to sonicate it uh, by reduction method hydrazine method 
So, as you are generating nickel ferrite you are also trying to incite to polymerize. So, both are happening in a single pot that is what we have uh, mentioned it here. So, you have a polymer support then you have a um, nickel ferrite uh, spinel which is generated and all in one chamber and in that case the sort of mechanism that we foresee is you get nice nickel ferrite particles and these may be randomly oriented, but they are actually embedded or intrinsically coated in a polymeric matrix. So, you actually generate a nano composite of this choice and as I have discussed in the last lecture this is the uh, machine that we use in our laboratory and this is the cartoon of the uh, sonochemical cell that we use. Um, individually if we prepare this spinel ferrite and the polyprol we can characterize it before we make a composite out of it and typically the particles are of the order of uh, 20 to 30 nanometer. You can see the TEM morphology of this nickel ferrite nanoparticles and you can see the SEM of the nanoparticles and uh, they are more like uh, uh, wafery uh, clusters of uh, oxides which are present and uh, typically you can see the uh, iron oxide uh, stretching frequency which is characterized by this and also um, the uh, spinal pattern which is emerging from the XRD. So, all we can clearly say is that we have a clear proof that we can make uh, nickel uh, ferrite nanopowders and uh, similarly we can make polypyrrole out of sonication take uh, uh, pyrrole and uh, sonicate it. This is the uh, SEM feature which clearly shows that um, you can get uh, fine particle polypyrrole uh, either as a, sh uh, as a very thin film form which can be coated on the sides or you can isolate this as a powder and uh, this will not be uh, crystalline because you can see here it shows a typical X-ray amorphous pattern. Uh, because it is a polymeric unit. Uh, nevertheless, the uh, IR shows typical stretching frequencies for polypyrrole. So, individually using sonochemistry we can establish the synthesis of both uh, uh, ferrite and uh, the uh, polypyrrole. Now, we can go one step further to prepare these composites and as I already discussed with you uh, take pyrrole then nickel ferrite and try to incite to polymerize then you can get this sort of composite and this is typical x-ray graph for the uh, composite. As you would see here uh, PPY which is the polypyrrole without any loading of uh, nickel ferrite and as you keep loading nickel ferrite even up to 90 percent of nickel ferrite in polypyrrole you still see a amorphous pattern that is the beauty. What does that mean? That there is a intricate mix of the pyrrole over every single particle of nickel ferrite as a result you do not see any x-ray pattern for nickel ferrite. Whereas, just the nickel ferrite prepared by um, sonar chemistry gives a clear XRD pattern. So, even with 10 percent in other words even with 10 percent of polypyrrole you can surface coat these powders effectively so as to mask the crystallinity. So, it is possible to uh, surface coat all this nickel ferrite particles using polypyrrole and in that way you are actually bringing about a conducting media between uh, any two given nickel ferrite particle because the outer cluster coating that is happening due to pyrrole is actually a conducting matrix and this is also clearly proved by the IR pattern. This is the typical uh, uh, stretching pattern for nickel ferrite and you would see only with 90 percent of nickel ferrite you see this intensity of the peak growing. So, um, this clearly proves that you can intimately coat the nickel ferrite particles with polymer and you can also see that there is typically no change in the morphology for polypyrrole and even 90 percent nickel ferrite which means uh, the morphology of the polypyrrole is retained even for a 90 percent composition whereas, 
nickel ferrite has a different ACM image. In the next slide you can see the um, x-ray pattern uh, sorry a TM pattern of this nickel ferrite this I have already shown the as prepared one and how the uh, ferrite loading uh, alters the uh, particle size of this uh, <coughs> composite and uh, the magnetic property shows a very clear systematic change with the increasing loading of nickel ferrite you can see the uh, magnetic uh, uh, signal is changing and uh, a very clear loop is seen in the middle and typically indicating these are soft magnets and uh, if one would uh, plot the loading concentration of nickel ferrite as a function of uh, e, uh, of the coercivity one can say that there is a, a plateau uh, between 50 to 90 percent. Um, so, uh, the coercivity does not seem to be largely affected by the coating. So, that although there is a uh, very small variation from 13 to 20 um, Oersted. So, um, the coercivity does not seem to be uh, varying much although the magnetic moment is sufficiently different uh, in the uh, po uh, polypyrrole coated nickel ferrite powders and you can also make a plot of the um, resistivity versus uh, temperature plot showing that they all are magnetic um, and uh, they are ferromagnetic as well as they are conducting only at low temperature you see this upturn in resistance mainly that is coming because of the conduction mechanism therefore, if you plot log rho versus t to the power minus half this is typically a model related to MOTS variable range hopping and if you make a plot of this you can see that there is almost a good agreement over the entire range for these particles uh, indicating that uh, there is a uh, 3D uh, variable range hopping when there is uh, larger doping of nickel ferrite whereas, with lean doping of uh, nickel ferrite the, um, the gamma value that is uh, the parameter for variable range hopping differs from 1 by 4 to half indicating that it goes through a 1D tunneling when the loading concentration of nickel ferrite is very less. So, we can make a very systematic analysis of how the properties are varying with respect to nickel ferrite loading and we can also try to see whether this has any pronounced effect on magneto resistance. We have seen that although magneto resistance is not highly altered yet there seems to be a systematic change for a 50 percent or a 90 percent uh, doping uh, compared to polypyrrole. So, in terms of uh, magnetic uh, influence definitely it does change whereas, um, the magneto resistance does not seem to be much altered with the nickel ferrite loading. And uh, one more example that we can think of is uh, using uh, this we can prepare n number of ferrites using a sono reduction process. So, far I told you how we can uh, prepare alloys and how we can trap these alloys and uh, how we can uh, try to make composites with the polymer support. Here is one uh, <coughs> example where we can use uh, a different variety of chemical processes, but coupled with uh, sono chemistry therefore, we coin this as sono reduction because this is typically a reduction process where you take a metal salt and try to reduce it with the hydrazine to prepare the corresponding nano metal. But what is interesting is the influence of sono chemistry on the resulting metal powder seems to be enormous uh, even though you are using a conventional um, chemical reduction route. So, uh, let us take the case of uh, iron or uh, cobalt. Now, this can be reduced into corresponding cobalt or iron powder uh, in sono chemistry, but you do not have to resort to any carbonyl or nitrosyl compounds of iron or cobalt. You can take simple metal salts instead of costly carbonyl or nitrosyl starting material and you can reduce it to corresponding metal. Now, what will happen suppose I take cobalt and iron and my final aim is to prepare cobalt Fe 2 O 4 which is 
final. So, which means I will take these two salts in the ratio 1 is to 2 and then I will try to reduce it and oxidize this to um, cobalt Fe 2 O 4. There are interesting things that are happening which we will see in the next slide. So, <coughs> we will see in the next slide how this uh, ferrites can be made. As you would see from this uh, two x-ray pattern interesting things happen. Now, when you take the cobalt and uh, iron salt and when you try to reduce it instead of passing oxygen if you are going to do this in argon atmosphere and if you are going to change to oxygen or air you can see the corresponding end products are not essentially the oxide. For example, if you bubble it in argon atmosphere the x-ray pattern that you get is peculiar and it is quite different from what we expected as cobalt Fe 2 O 4. So, if you carefully look at this pattern this amounts to CO Fe 2 which is a ferromagnetic alloy and in the literature there is no way that you can make this alloy using a wet chemistry route. You would always end up with a oxide and the only way that you can prepare such a alloy is by conventional metallurgical route where you can use a crystal growth method or so to grow a CO Fe 2 alloy, but it has never been reported in the wet chemistry uh, approaches to isolate a cobalt Fe 2 alloy of this form with a clear single phase. What is the advantage? Um, if you can prepare such alloys then it is possible for us to make any sort of shapes of this alloys because it is easy to make um, the samples of any shape with the alloy compared to a uh, oxide. So, if you could make it into a rod or a rod shape or a pellet shape then you can correspondingly try to decompose this into the corresponding ferrite. For example, if I now take this alloy and try to heat it in air then what I expect is a spinal uh, ferrite which is nothing but CO Fe 2 O 4. So, this is one of the first time that we could ever show that such a alloy we are talking about uh, CO Fe 2 and this is uh, based on the mole percent of this. So, you are actually talking about a alloy composition somewhere here which is supposed to be actually um, BCC, but what we are getting is actually a FCC CO um, Fe 2 alloy and this is the first time we have uh, demonstrated that using sonar chemistry you can prepare alloy of any nature if you can do this reaction just in argon. So, if you instead of taking uh, uh, argon if you directly bubble through either air compressed air or if you uh, can do it in oxygen atmosphere straight away in one shot you can actually get CO Fe 2 O 4. As you would know the conventional solid state method you take CO O plus Fe 2 O 3 and when you heat it uh, it can this can be either CO or CO 3 O 4 for that matter then the corresponding oxide will be CO Fe 2 O 4 if you take in stoichiometric proportion. So, this is the conventional way of preparing, but for the first time we could observe that cobalt ferrite can be made even using a amorphous uh, alloy as a precursor and uh, you can see here this is the um, morphology of CO Fe 2 alloy and this is the morphology of CO Fe 2 O 4 and this is the SEM pattern of the oxide powder that we can prepare and uh, these are the cobalt Fe 2 nanoparticles which are prepared and the dimensions of the lattice spacing exactly matches with that of the um, CO Fe 2 O 4 Fe 2 phase. Therefore, we can clearly prove that it is so, but from a chemist point of view it is much easier for us to ascertain whether it is really the alloy or the oxide itself. How do we do that? Take the alloy powder that you prepare and try to do Tg. So, usually we are all familiar that Tg we always think about weight loss when you heat any sample, but if you are actually going to take CO Fe 2 and if you are going to heat it in air then you would not expect a weight loss, but you would you should expect a 
weight gain because it is going from COFE2 to COFE2O4 therefore, it has to be a weight gain and as you can see here interestingly it shows a clear increase in weight and this weight gain say from 100 to 121 exactly corresponds to the weight gain that you would expect out of COFE204. So, just simple uh, TG technique can be used to ascertain what is exactly going on and by this way we have made sure that you are exactly isolating a alloy powder of this form and you can also see corresponding to that is a, a typical endothermic uh, uh, conversion uh, because there is a uh, weight uptake uh, due to uh, conversion from alloy to oxide. So, that is clearly seen in the uh, DTA curves and uh, we also see that uh, the formation of the oxide is pronounced due to this uh, uh, typical stretching which observes at uh, uh, 600 uh, centimeter inverse confirming that the oxide formation is indeed correct and we can also clearly distinguish between the alloy and the oxide powder. If you take a typical M versus uh, H loop the alloy composition will have more moment compared to the oxide composition. So, you clearly see the change in the uh, magnetization values between the alloy and the uh, compound and as you see here the change in the coercivity also is there for the uh, alloy as prepared powder if you are going to do a temperature sweep saying that uh, this is truly a um, ferromagnetic alloy. Now, as last example I would like to uh, uh, cover this issue that sonochemistry can be used as a uh, tool for preparation of porous metal oxides and this was actually uh, exploited more by Gedenkens group. Um, for example, you think of uh, just uh, technologically important iron oxide or you think of uh, CO3O4 or you can think of uh, uh, tin oxide, uh, nickel oxide which is antiferromagnetic. Uh, you can prepare any sort of uh, precursors, um, any sort of oxides using corresponding precursors. So, if you are thinking of Fe2O3, there are protocols by which you can prepare that nicely using iron 3 ethoxide. If you want to prepare uh, tin oxide, then you can use tin ethoxide. The general protocol that uh, Gerenskin group has followed in preparing complex metal ions or porous metal oxides uh, start with the inorganic precursor like uh, ethoxide as uh, listed here. Take this uh, with the surfactant in ethanol and try to uh, form a gel by adding ammonium hydroxide. So, yes, essentially going to uh, precipitate this as a hydroxide. So, you get a gel here and gel you try to sonicate it for 3 hours then you get a precipitate uh, from this gel and this precipitate you can centrifuge you can wash and dry under vacuum and then you can get a as prepared compound and this as prepared compound can be either amorphous or it can be crystalline directly indicating that you are getting something. Um, so, if it is amorphous then you try to calcine it um, and try to see the porosity of this metal oxides they are indeed porous. Now, this can be adopted for several applications because there are several devices where you would like to have a porous metal oxide in such case you follow this sort of a uh, protocol where um, whenever you do not require a, uh, a porous metal oxide then you can completely eliminate this protocol and go for uh, a simpler one like the sonar reduction method that I was talking about where you just reduce it and immediately convert it into oxide even without involving a calcination. So, that is the beauty because uh, most of the wet chemical routes it involves isolation of a, a metal oxide and then converting it into a crystalline phase by another protocol involving calcination for long hours or for short uh, time. But what we see from uh, sonar chemical uh, approaches you do not even need to prepare uh, to calcinate the compound directly by bubbling it because of the cavitation and because of the high uh, temperature that you can generate uh, locally these compounds which prepare they are not only 
amorphous in the beginning, but they tend to crystallize on uh, as you sonicate it for a uh, few hours. Uh, this is uh, uh, these are some of the news that is coming, uh, which I wanted to highlight that um, uh, in Israel's nanotech research, uh, which was reported this uh, month, we found that uh, Gedenkens group has made uh, another contribution, where he has used uh, uh, sonochemistry to develop sterile hospital sheets and ropes, um, and this has been patented, and uh, they are trying to look for variety of applications. They have also tried to uh, observe another interesting aspect in the recent past which uh, which has come out in the literature a one step synthesis of prolate spheroidal shaped carbon uh, produced by thermolysis of octane under its autogenic pressure. The autogenic pressure is nothing but sonochemistry here, but what they found was when they thermalize several of hydrocarbons like octane in this case, they found that typically this particular prolate spheroidal shape of carbon they are able to isolate and this seems to be critical characteristic of sonicating any hydrocarbon in uh, using uh, ultrasound and uh, there is a lot of interesting applications that are foreseen for this set sort of compounds. So, several things are happening it is not just uh, merely preparing um, oxides or alloys of uh, different kind, but uh, several other applications can be envisaged and worked out using sonochemistry. I will also touch upon one more interesting application which I have not covered uh, in general under the uh, title of metal synthesis. Uh, this is another uh, company which is using ultrasound technology um, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, as you would see in the next slide more efficiency and better quality with ultrasonic activated processor envisage in the um, drug making company. So, drug and pharma industries are also uh, seriously involved in using ultrasound to make uh, uh, good and better quality medicines, um, especially when you are making tablets like this what is critical is that you need a mono sized one to get a good compact otherwise your uh, tablet will crack if you are going to have a different size range. So, mono sized particles of your uh, tablet uh, of your uh, medicine is very important for pharma industry therefore, they are resorting to sonicating the sort of uh, um, compounds that they are finally, planning to take it. For example, the real drug may be actually dispersed in a safe matrix uh, it could be a polymer or it could be a oxide some matrix where such tablets are made. So, uh, the base material has to be mono size and that is what we see here you can see this is one of the uh, powder that the pharma industry makes and size reduction or of color uh, within the nano range um, is uh, emphasized which is possible using ultrasound. So, several applications are there which are hidden uh, not necessarily coming out in open uh, as a material synthesis and uh, therefore, in the last two uh, exercise I have told you how um, the ultrasound can be used this is again a view graph of how the pharma industry is actually using ultrasound in emulsifying in dispersing in homogenizing uh, the compounds ultrasound is regularly used and uh, this is one of the simplest uh, uh, setup uh, that any laboratory can afford to manipulate or to engineer new materials. So, um, I have highlighted in the last two lectures uh, how ultrasound can be used for um, uh, for material synthesis, uh, but as you would see from the history it was the organic people who have exploited in the earlier years how to prepare organic molecules and uh, how to uh, make uh, some conversions very effective and also improving yield and they have come out with some theme saying that uh, only cation uh, in uh, reactions involving cations are speeded up uh, by ultrasound free radicals are affected by uh, ultrasound and um, lot of uh, understanding is there now in the organic synthesis on the use of ultrasound and also in the last two lectures I have highlighted 
uh, several examples of how we can make inorganic solids using ultrasound waves. So, I stop here um, and we will continue with uh, other uh, non-conventional uh, chemical routes in the next few lectures.